Is a recession coming? Are private lenders replacing bank mortgages? And is that leading to a lot more risky investments? We're gonna talk about that and a lot more starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. He's back. Ben Rabideau was a guest on Debt Free in 30 back on episode number 94 in June of 2016. That was three and a half years ago, so he did a great job, so we've, we've had him back. And that interview was done over the phone, so today Ben is here in person in my office here at Young and King in downtown Toronto. Ben, welcome back and thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. So give us the quick introduction for those who are not familiar with you of what you do. Sure. So I run a research firm and uh, we spend a lot of time looking at Canadian household credit trends, housing, and just general macroeconomic trends. And we work with uh, primarily institutional investors to try to help them kind of form a, a view on the economy, the direction of rates, currencies, and, and particular securities. So we're going to talk about what's going to happen because you're all going to, you're going to tell us what's, you're going to pull out the crystal ball and tell us what's, I'll, what's we'll going to happen shot. My, my crystal ball is uh, not a perfect track <laughs> record. Foggy <but> like <laughs> everyone else's. So... Okay, now let's get into the interesting stuff and then we'll talk about all the numbers here. Because uh, I went on to the Google and I did a search for your name because, you know, I do a lot of advanced show prep for these these shows, you know, like I'm a, I'm a big time TV guy here. And we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but because <laughs> we've got lots of other stuff to, to, to talk about. But shortly after you were a guest on the podcast in 2016, you began tweeting on the Twitter machine that you were concerned about risky syndicated mortgage loans. Mm-hmm. Okay, that doesn't sound that exciting. You know, what's what's the big deal? In one tweet, you predicted that the OSC, which of course is the Ontario Securities Commission, would take control of syndicated mortgages and slam the door, these are your words, on shadier operators. Hmm. Now, in that tweet, you didn't mention a company by name, but shortly thereafter, you were sued for libel by a company called Fortress Real Developments. And... My understanding is that began like a two-year uh, legal battle that finally ended August of 2018 when the Ontario Court of Appeal finally dismissed the lawsuit, basically saying it was a gag proceeding. It was something done to shut you up, I think yep. was, was my legal interpretation of that. No, that's exactly correct. Okay, now I'm not a lawyer and you ended up being proven right, but the effect of suing someone mm -hmm. for speaking out is, I would assume, that others won't speak out. Yeah, and actually let me jump in because I'll, I would point out that... I was actually sued for a number of tweets. That was that was one of them. And it was sort of an ongoing back and forth where I would point out some concerns I had around the marketing of these particular investments. Uh, and then I would get these very threatening legal letters. You go, okay, well, do I really want to get into a protracted legal battle? So you back off. And then after a while, I'm like, man, I just can't, I can't handle this. This, this advertising is egregious. So you start chirping them again, CCing the regulator, trying to get some some action. Get another threatening letter, back off. And finally, it's just like, you know what? This is stupid. They're going to sue me. They're going to sue me. And so you're right. I, I, that was one of the tweets that they complained about. Uh, and what's interesting is, is since then, we've seen that syndicated mortgages actually have come under the purview of a new regulator, uh, which is more akin to the OSC. And uh, sure enough, uh, operators that were wholesaling that Fortress syndicated mortgage product were all shut down. Not not by that regulator, by actually, but by by Fisco, which was the the regulator that I would argue did a terrible job of protecting consumers. So the fallout of all of that, to your point, is there was this tremendous um, what we would call libel chill, right, where people are concerned about raising awareness because they would get threatening letters. I mean, I had a friend that was threatened by these same idiots because he pointed out that they have a stained background. The principles of Fortress had been banned for life the one guy had banned for life from mutual fund dealers association and both of them had a 15-year ban from the osc but who amongst us hasn't been banned well okay for but, life but so, so mean, picture know. this so these guys these are the two guys running an investment company and this guy says these guys have some stained background libel notice yeah. from these big even though that was actually firm. true what totally said. true totally yeah. true and so you know, the effect of all of this is that is that there were somewhere on the order of nine hundred million dollars raised from Ontario consumers that went into these investment. So, so products. can you walk us through what we're talking about? So what do you mean by syndicated mortgages, and what was this nine hundred million? What how did it work? Yeah. So the the premise was you were lending money to developers 
on real estate projects. And so these would be individual investors. So a guy yep. like me, maybe I've managed to save up, I don't know, 50, 100,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I've got it in my savings account where I'm only earning like zero. Yep. And so I find out, hey, I can earn more with, with these guys. Yeah. Yeah. They would say 8%. 8%. Okay. And it was secured on real estate. So, so you're safe. Sounds like a risk-free kind of thing to me or pretty yeah. close well, to so it. Well, so the issue was, so the idea was developer would go in, buy a parcel of land, and then they want to eventually build a condo on it. But, but in between it being a raw piece of land and them having a condo there, they've got to spend all this money and having it rezoned and you know, building a sales center and hitting sales targets. And, and all this stuff costs a lot of money. So that's all before the banks will actually give you money to put a shovel in the ground. And so what they would do is they would raise money to fund those soft costs on mm -hmm. the development. Fine. I mean, that, that's uh, p people will invest in that all the time. It's generally considered an equity investment. So there is no real security on those, but, but whatever. That's not, that in and of itself is not a problem. The issue became that as I started digging into these investments, I'd pull the land registry data on on the land itself because that's yeah i'm just i'm always curious about stuff like that so you pull it up and you'd see weird things where it's like this parcel of land was bought for three million dollars it would close by a you know fortress entity and then the next day there'd be like nine million dollars of mortgages registered against this piece of land they just bought for three million but they were representing to their investors that hey you've got security on this parcel of land we've registered you on on title. And so if anything goes wrong, we'll just sell the land and get your money back. But I'm like, well, well, wait, you just bought this for 3 million and there's $9 million registered against it. And then where it got really weird is then you'd see the investor um, presentations and it would say things like, oh, this is an 80% loan to value loan, which means they're going to register 80% of the value of the land in a mortgage. So that would imply, so on that particular one, if it's $9 million, that would imply the land value of something like $12 million. Yeah. Or they've, or only, or or they've only registered 2.7 million on the three. One right. The so something doesn't make sense. And so then you'd start digging into, well, how are they establishing the value of this land? And it was just by this somewhat uh, convoluted means to, to try to show that like if, had, if they could build out the full development and, and achieve their maximum profit, then, well, this is sort of the residual value of the land, but that has no bearing on yeah, the actual value if you had to seize that vacant land and sell it. And so now subsequent to all, you know, now that all this has happened, we've, we, we find that two, two major developments. One is most of those projects have now been taken over uh, by an arm's length administrator to try to sort of unwind all of this, these shenanigans. So they actually have set up a separate entity, taken it away from these fortress entities, and they're trying to recover the investor's money as best they can. More interesting is, um, I'm trying to think whether that was May of 2018, they were raided by the RCMP That's in a, a fraud problem. investigation. So the RCMP actually showed up to Fortress' office, carried away all the laptops, everything, and they're under, at this point, criminal investigation. So no charges laid, you know, and, and even if they do, they get their day in court. So not suggesting there's, you know, no you, you improprieties. Know, well, nothing's been proven, but but certainly I would say that my concerns were warranted, and and it's still shocking to me that you get a reputable major Bay Street firm like Norton Rose Fulbright that's out there running a scorched earth campaign against people like me just trying to raise awareness around potential risks. This is like it's total bullshit, right? Yeah. And you got reputable lawyers doing this, like it's and ridiculous. And so, are you going to keep tweeting? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I got the, a big uh, mouth. I just and, it, and is there anything else you want to say right now that can be used as evidence in the next libel lawsuit against you from the next one? <laughs> who, who's your next target? Who are you going after here? Who's the next hey, listen, one? Listen, man, I don't, I, I don't have, I just, if, if there's something that's super. If it comes up, you're going to speak Sketchy, out. I'm going to, I'll, yeah. I'll call it like I see yeah, it. Yeah, and, and you're similar to me in that, well, and our, you know, friend, Mr. Terrio, same thing that when we see things that are ridiculous, like what's going on with the whole student loan thing and a whole bunch of other debt related stuff, mm -hmm. then we blab our mouths on it too. Um, we're great. lucky in that we haven't been sued for libel at this point yet, but, uh, yeah, if you know stuff, you got to speak up, which well, is that's it. kind that's of, kind of one of the reasons we got you here. So, so let's keep talking about mortgages then, because the world has changed in the world of mortgages. So many years ago, you went to the bank, you got a mortgage, you had your 20% down payment, it was all nice and civil, and it was, it was no big deal. 
But of course, as you're very well aware, we've now got all these stress tests. Mortgages are, are harder to get from the major banks. Would you agree with that or am I? Absolutely true. So, so what am I to do? Because the real estate market in certain markets is still booming. Certainly right here in downtown Toronto, mm -hmm. the condos that we can see outside our window here continue to go up in value. Now we can talk about what's happening in the outlying areas and whether there's some softness there, but more, you know, real estate always goes up. We all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Never, never goes down. But if the banks aren't willing to lend, then I've got to go to private lenders. Is that my, my next source? And is that kind of where this whole fortress thing came in? Or is that totally unrelated because they were more on the commercial end? And no, it, I'd say it's unrelated. So they're, they're so, well, it's not totally true. It's an offshoot. They're sort of, they're similar in that the fortress phenomenon and the booming private lending phenomenon are somewhat related in that it's symptomatic. The fact that people are investing in these in, in such size is symptomatic of just kind of a low rate reach mm -hmm. for yield type environment. Yeah. Right? Cause what else am I supposed to do if I can only earn, you know, half a 1% on a savings account yeah. and I, I don't really want to be in the stock market cause I've heard that that's risky and it goes up and down and all the yeah. rest of it. I'm a, a more stable investor. I like T bills and GICs and things like that, but they don't pay anything either. So right. that's where you get into yeah. these. And, and I, I need to be really clear on this cause I don't want to confuse your listeners. I, I don't suggest for a moment that private lenders are on the same risk profile as a fortress syndicated mortgage investment. Because most private lenders will lend only to a certain loan to value threshold, typically, you know, max 80%, and, and many will do even less than that. And they'll register on title and you can see like there's actual collateral back. It's an actual that real thing. It's a real loan. So so you're getting eight percent, you're lending to subprime credit, people that can't get a mortgage from a bank. So there's much elevated risk, but you're also being paid for that risk. Um, so what would be the profile then on both sides of that equation? Why is someone who has a 20% down payment, because if it's 80% mm -hmm. loan to value, why can't they go to a conventional bank? Well, there's a few reasons. Typically, it would be related to the collateral itself, so, so the property. So for example, you might have a bit of an oddball type property where it's might not be in downtown Toronto. It might be out in the middle of nowhere. It might be a farm property. Sure, it could be some mixed use thing where you get like some storefront and then a house above it or so, something like that. That where where a bank would look at that and go, eh, it just doesn't fit in our box. Um, more often than not, it's related to the credit worthiness of the borrower. So and usually that's related to the ability to show income or uh, um, some sort of bruised credit issue. So maybe I'm self-employed. Yeah, usually. So if you're self-employed, you still have options at. Um, some of the second tier, kind of the, the B-side lenders, so home trust, equitable trust. Uh, and they'll generally do kind of 65% loan to value, 80% loan to value for self-employed with provable business income and, you know, audited Got financials. show tax and, returns, that kind right, of thing. Right. And so it's still, you know, there's a it's slightly different risk profile than a, an employed individual with a longstanding employment history, um, but not necessarily bad credit per se. Now, so you raise the issue of income. Mm -hmm. So if I was a lender, then yeah. And, and you know, if, when someone comes in here to do a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, they have to tell us what their income is. I want to see your pay stubs. That's a pretty good way to prove what your income is. I assume that's common in the mortgage industry, is it, that you got to prove what your income is? Or because isn't this what we got into a lot of trouble in the U.S. with, with uh, people saying, oh, yes, I make, you know, 10,000 bucks a month and no, I don't have any proof. Do we? Right. Is that an issue here or is that not a big deal? Here? The underwriting is very different. And I think anyone that tries to draw a straight line parallel between stuff that happened in the U.S. and anything that's happening in Canada is just not not particularly informed. So on the prime side, definitely they're going to verify income. Now, are there issues around misrepresenting income? You know, I would say that's a little more pervasive than people generally perceive. I mean, we had an Equifax report that came out last week. I don't know if you saw it. And they were basically saying 23% you know, of millennials say it'd, it'd be okay to kind of fib on a credit application. And, and something like, I don't know, what it was, 16 or 18% have admitted to, to mm -hmm. doing that. So, you know, and, and how does that compare to every other age group? Similar a little or? higher, actually. A little okay, higher. a little higher. Yeah. But every age group. Yeah, but see, you got to remember as well, like who's more inclined to overstate their income? It's people trying to get into the market. Right. So for, you know, for, for the boomers, they Warren probably. Warren Buffett probably doesn't have to worry about it. So right. Or, or the boomers who have been in the property market for decades. I mean, yeah, they, nice. they have lots of equity. They can, they can kind of trade sideways however they want. Right? Well, there was an article in the Toronto Star a few weeks ago um, about a guy who I think he was a barber or something. His income was, oh, yeah. remember, you remember this, this yeah, article? Yeah, 
Um, and you know what city he was in, uh, Brampton, I believe. Yep. His income was 2500 bucks a month from his, his job, mm-hmm. and his mortgage payments were 4300 bucks a month. And yeah, that's some classic Brampton. That's classic there. there, eh? Well, but you also have to remember there was... Um, there was part of the article that talked about how he basically rented out every square right. foot of his house. Yeah, to the make basement, the... two other rooms. Yeah, but still, room. I mean, you, you look at that and that's not a loan that's going to be underwritten by a big bank. That would be, I would suspect he's with a private lender, mm-hmm. uh, maybe an alternative lender. But that's, um, you know, that, that that's a loan that's probably not showing up on a bank balance sheet as prime. I actually tried to... Just again, because I'm always curious about these things. I tried to figure out who funded that loan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I couldn't yeah. find it. Because you wonder, right? Like if that was a you know Royal Bank, you'd go, yeah. what, that, what's that up with that? The regulators would not be happy about yeah. that. Now, of course, we don't know all the circumstances. Maybe he had a co-signer. Maybe his father is rich. Fair he enough. signed yeah, up. 100% knows? that could be true. Maybe this cross-collateralized against some other house. Yeah. Like you don't know, but but the headline numbers were certainly yeah. kind of head scratching. You got to kind of dig a little bit deeper to find out. Yeah. So if I was an investor... I shouldn't be horribly concerned about dealing with a private lender because, as you said, so long as I understand what the rules are, you're only lending 80% loan to value. I'm getting compensated for my risk. You know, it's well, it's it's more it's more complex than that. So if I were an investor, I would make sure that I understood the mix of first and seconds because a lot of private lenders skew towards second mortgages, and you need to be really careful on that. If you're in second position, and the first mortgage goes into default. Like people don't think through this. So so the appeal of a second mortgage, you might get more like 11 to 15% as opposed to maybe 8 to 10% on a first. Um, and so the issue is if the first mortgage goes delinquent and you're in second position, well, the first mortgage is going to, um, you know, they'll, they'll control the power of sale process, right? And so they'll hire the most expensive lawyers. They'll you know, do everything they can. And your equity position gets eaten up because you're no longer in control of the cost and you're no longer in control of the process. So you get wiped out in second position. So the the only alternative to protect your equity most times is that you have to pay to keep the first current so that the second controls the power of sale process. Now, I'll just tell you, most mortgage investment corporations have not been around long enough to see a down cycle. Mm-hmm. And consequently, they don't hold reserves to do exactly that thing. And so it's really problematic. So my, my issue would be, if you're going to invest in a mortgage investment corporation, invest in one that's very reputable, right? It has been around for, for a long time that has seen some cycles. And I would say, you know, if you're going to skew towards the second, just make sure that you know it's a much, much higher risk profile. You get paid for the risk, but but the chance of getting wiped out is much higher, right? As opposed to some, like, there are some that I know out there, I, I know guys in the private space that I would trust absolutely with my money, even in this this market um, where I would say there's, you know, some froth in, in the real estate side of things. But but still, these guys are, are guys that are lending to 65% loan to value on prime real estate, fairly liquid. You're getting an 8% coupon. You look at that and you go like, that's not a terrible risk, mm-hmm. right? So I, Yeah. And if they've got a bit of cash in the bank, then they can keep the first mortgage current if they need to. Well, they're only first position, they're right? Only, okay, and so, so and then. so, but there are some out there that I see that will run to 95% LTV in second position. That's a yeah. total disaster. Well, you get the, wiped out in a heartbeat. Well, right? and if the real estate market goes down by 5%. No, not even. So here, here's what you're missing, Doug. So if, you're, if you've are if you loaned to 95% second position, let's say the first mortgage is 80%. The frictional costs of going through the power of sale process are generally 10 to 15%. Because you got to pay lawyers. You got to keep the hydro on while the process is going That's on. That's right. You got to pay stuff. your realtor fees. Generally, if if they've gone delinquent on the mortgage, there's some maintenance issues on the Property house. Taxes. You got to bring it up to make it saleable. And so, and so, and, and a good example of this is if you look at the mortgage insurers like CMHC and and Genworth, um, they're the ones that alone that'll insure up to ninety five percent loan to value and on on kind of the prime side, and you can see in their financials their cost of going through the power of sale process, and it's it's often as high as thirty percent. Wow. And so if you're in second position at 95%, you're wiped out. You're wiped out even in a good market, right? Yeah. So like to me that's that's crazy. So you got to understand the risk not just of the real estate market going down but just the cost of doing it. So, yeah, I would just say don't touch those. Yeah, don't right? touch, don't, them. Don't, don't you touch them. You go, stick with a mix that's going to, you know, has a conservative LTV threshold. Uh, you know, no more than I mean, absolute max 80%. I wouldn't be comfortable at 80%, but, but, you yeah. know. And I haven't started seeing people who've gotten nailed with those sorts of things yet, but I guess it's coming. So oh, it's, we'll, it's happening. So we'll wait. Now let's flip it around. So I'm not the investor, I'm the borrower. Mm-hmm. And I would like to get into this real estate market. So a few questions for you. Number one, you know, what can I do to get a mortgage? Like if you don't qualify to bank? Yeah. 
I mean, look, if you have to go to a private lender, unless you have a really clear articulated exit plan, then I would say you just shouldn't own. Like you it's, should you, it's just, I mean, this idea that you have to own this property, even if you're going to pay 10%, you know, to, to, like what people need to realize about these mortgages is they're one year loans and there's no commitment to renew that mortgage, right? So, so if, if you I'm take going a, through a private lender, right, right. So, well, I, with any bank actually, but, but with the big banks, it's sort of understood that if you've been current and everything, they're, they're just they're going to renew your mortgage, right? Uh, and there's a lot of reputational risk at the big banks. They, w- they wouldn't just kick you out on the street because it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. They're, they're chartered banks and the government's not gonna be happy with that. But, you know, Joe private lender, right? Who's running a portfolio of a few million dollars. He didn't care about that, right? And so at the end of the one year term, if he wants his money back and you can't find a new lender, you're out of luck. He's taking your house, yeah, right? And so, I mean, I would say the only time that ever makes sense is let's say you have bruised credit, but you have a very clear plan to how to rebuild it within a year or two. Mm -hmm. Or if you're self-employed, you don't show income, but you'd like to start showing income so your line 150 or whatever it is, is is now high enough that you qualify to prime lender. And so it's a very clear temporary solution. Now, yeah. I would my preference in that situation would be, well, just wait and rent wait and rebuild it. Yeah. But but if you're absolutely gung-ho on doing that, well, fine. But just know the risk. Like you, you can absolutely get thrown out on that loan. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you on that. I think I wrote a book and had a chapter or two on that exact <laughs> same thing if we want to put the plug in there for the, for the book. So, okay, let's pull out your crystal ball now. Then. Yep. So what do you see in the future? Are we, you know, is the real estate market going to keep humming or is it not? What, what do I you think? I mean, define the future. See? Well, so let's say, you know, Six not... Six months, a yeah, year, five yeah, years. Yeah, well, that, you know, all of the above. Okay. So like tomorrow will look exactly the same as today. I don't think anything's going to change tomorrow yeah. unless, I don't know, Trump or Trudeau or somebody does something crazy. But what do you see... You know, six months, a year, even sure. into into the five year time frame. Um, so there's a lot of momentum in real estate markets. They they don't generally stop on a dime. It's sort of a long, slow turn. And we went through a period of about a year and a half of pretty soft markets in all the major metros in in Canada. And we're sort of through that. And so you're talking like May 2017. Yeah, mid 2017. To... <clears throat> excuse me, kind of to the end of 2018. Okay. We'll call it. And so 2019, and we're recording this in the fall of 2019, has been decent. Started off slow, picking up steam throughout the year. And are you talking about Canada, Ontario, Toronto, North America? It, it, well, okay, we'll talk Canada specifically, but of course there's no national real estate right. market. We know it's local, but but if you sort of threw everything in the blender and looked at how, kind of tried to take the, the temperature across the country, um, the market is definitely picking up. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, like you, you see Vancouver still looks quite weak, mm-hmm. um, but even it's picked up a little bit, but it's a lot of that's just base effect because you had... You, know, you were printing 25-year lows in sales volumes last year at this time. Yeah. So it's pretty hard to get below 25-year yeah, lows. Once you're at zero, you're, you've only <laughs> got to get like Right. Yeah. So a lot of that's base effect that the, the sales volumes don't look great on a on sort of a long-term basis. Uh, and there's still a lot of inventory accumulating in that market. And I think more to come. So I, I'd say Vancouver is one that still looks pretty dicey to me, um, but better than it did three months ago. And so, you know... It, is it probably likely to improve in the next little while? Probably. You get a little a little better, just to probably as a function of lower rates. Because it's been low. Yeah. And, but I'd say you get into the Toronto and Southern Ontario, it looks very good. I mean, it's come off of the kind of doldrums of 2018 and, uh, and the market, um, it, there's not a ton of supply. It's not oversupplied in the resale market. Sales are, are not amazing, but they're, they're decent. So the market balance is, is, is good and probably tilting towards kind of the seller side of things. So you know, if all you did is took a snapshot of the market and assume that, listen, these markets have a lot of momentum, then you'd probably say six months from now, it's probably still going to look pretty good. And is it possible that five years from now, it's still looking pretty good? Or is that, it's impossible well, it's to possible. say? It's possible. I mean, I would say that for the first time since 2007, we're starting to see signs that recession risks are elevated. Um, now, that's not to say that one's coming for sure and it's never 100%, but you know, there's certain indicators that you would look for ahead of a recession or, or at least ahead of a, a, a job cycle um, where you might see a, a period of weakness in, in employment. And I would argue that you're starting to see some of that. Um, and so my guess would be the back half of this year, once we start getting the Q3, Q4 GDP numbers are going to disappoint. And I'd be surprised if towards the end of this year and into early next year, we didn't start seeing 
a bit of a soft patch in employment. And is that really the key indicator you watch? So what's the unemployment rate doing? Well, it is a big factor in housing, huge. And you know, there's a lot of dynamics that play into housing. It's, it's complicated, but everything from rates to credit availability, population growth, the strength of the economy and the, and the labor market, all of that factor in. But, but jobs and interest rates are, would probably be two of the biggest ones. And what do you see on interest rates? Well, that's a tough one. I would say if we do get a patch of weakness, um, rates have definitely have the potential to go lower. Um, you know, it, Which blows my mind because aren't they pretty low now? They're low. Absolutely, they're low. Uh, and But they could absolutely... I mean, look, globally, there are a lot of just deflationary forces at work. Uh, you see rates that are pushing zero in a lot of developed uh, economies. And if you get through a patch of weakness in Canada, it's not inconceivable that you see kind of five-year mortgage rates push back down towards kind of 2%. I mean, I'm not saying that's that's for sure, but that's it's a possibility. If, if you get a weak economy, I would say it's likely. What are the deflationary forces you see? Aging population, so, debt dynamics of people having to pay down debt, you know, a bit of a deleveraging cycle is deflationary because it, you know, it's it's money that's being diverted from consumption into repaying debt. So we don't have to get too much into the kind of yeah. the weeds of, of that stuff for the listeners. But I would say, you know, if I if you were to ask me what am I more worried about, inflation ramping up to twenty percent or inflation dropping closer to zero, uh, I would definitely say the latter. Yeah, because as I get older, I don't buy a bigger house. I buy a smaller house. Right, and that's, that's kind of that's what right. delever- deleveraging is, obviously. And so the baby boomers now are obviously, you know, seniors mm-hmm. or very close to it. So that's that's uh, that's driving that. And I don't know, I guess if I was running for president of the United States next year, I would want interest rates as low as possible to pump the economy oh, he's, up. He's trying it. hard to talk them down. Yeah. For sure. But of course, it's not quite that simple because if interest rates go down, that also has a negative effect on your currency. So it's not like you can just, you know, turn one dial. But I guess if everyone else is doing it too, then you've got to do it as well. Is that? Right, right. I mean, it's globally, there's kind of this, we're in a period now where there's some kind of currency tensions. People are trying to to sort of uh, find a way to make their exports a little more attractive, especially given some of the trade tensions. So you're right. It's generally tends to be kind of vented through currencies and rates. Now, what I would say, though, in all that is, you know, you'd asked earlier, where do I see the housing market in five years? And I, mean, I, you know, I don't know. But I would say that the same concerns are still there. I mean, we know that housing is not affordable uh, in most metros. I mean, yeah, I would say there's certain areas. I mean, I'd, I'd argue Alberta. I mean, it's pretty hard to say that uh, housing there is dramatically, you know, unaffordable it, it, house prices haven't moved in 10 years yeah. in Alberta right yeah. that's not a bubble like it's just not yeah uh, a lot of the froth has come out of the big market so you don't see the sort of speculation happening but but still house prices are extremely elevated and to me the the degree to which the Canadian economy has levered growth off of housing and consumption and I would say that consumption generally is, a, is sort of a derivative of strong housing because there's a very pronounced wealth effect as your house goes up. You tend to spend a bit more mm-hmm. as people move and, and, and the real estate market is active. You, know, you move houses. First thing you do is you renovate it. You buy some new furniture. So there's this very strong kind of spending effect around housing. Uh, and, and it's undeniable that we've levered a lot of growth off of that. And if so, so that risk is still there, that this unaffordable housing market plus an economy that's tremendously levered off of this could set us up for just a, a period of pretty pronounced and extended weakness in, in the economy. Um, but I would have said that a couple of years ago too. So, it, you know, that, that yeah. hasn't changed, right? And I wouldn't say it's those risks are, are, are necessarily heightened from where they were a year ago. Yeah, because inevitable and imminent are two different words. You didn't mention the word debt. Mm-hmm. So it's going up as far as I can remember, like for it the is. last 20 years. Yeah, we just printed a new high in the debt to income ratio in Canada. Now, some of the pundits would say, well, yeah, but you got to look at the asset side of the lever mm-hmm. of the ledger. Yeah, because that includes mortgages. So, okay, my house went up from a million to a million five and my mortgage went up from 200,000 to 300,000. Okay, well, that's a 50% increase in debt, but it doesn't really mean anything. Right. But it's not just mortgage debt that's going up. No, I'll, I'll tell you the concern in all this. So if we take a, a snapshot of the current debt picture in Canada, one of the things that jumps out is the debt service ratio, which is the share of household disposable income that's diverted towards servicing debt. It just hit a 30-year high. Yeah, and um, that that to me is the biggest problem right there. That's a huge problem. So you got to think, okay, well, 30-year high, the last time that we were anywhere close to this, so there was a bit of a blip in like 2007 ahead of the, the, the US recession, but... You go back to the 80s when you had, 
Well, the de- the, the, the 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 actual series starts in 1990. So, but at that time, even 1990, you know what interest rates were mm-hmm. doing? You know, very high. Yep. Right. And and so you think that today the share of household disposable income that goes towards servicing debt is much higher than it was back when rates were four times what they are today. That's a big concern, right? So so that's a concern. Um, and I'd say it's a bit, that, that is the big concern that I would have is just that, that not only are debt levels high, but it's starting to really, like there was a period there where debt levels were rising, but interest rates were falling so much that it sort of offset it and the carrying cost of that debt wasn't yeah. alarming. That, that's the key because it doesn't matter how much debt I have. If my income keeps going up, I can keep paying my debt. I can have, right. or if have rates keep falling, yeah. right? Then, then the ability And that's to what's been fine. happening for right. You know, ten years rates have fallen. My debt goes up, but I'm paying the same amount out yeah. every month. No big yeah. deal, and that's obviously fueled the real estate market. Yeah. But if and you're you're not expecting interest rates to increase. If anything, they probably go the other way in the short term. Potentially, but but it doesn't at this point. The stock of debt is so high, and and I don't think income growth is going to be particularly impressive in the next over the next year or so. Yeah. Um, I don't think that ratio moves a lot. So it's it, it could come down a little bit in the next few quarters just as a function of rates coming down. Um, but it's still very high, right? And yeah. so that to me is a big warning sign to consumers because generally what you find is that is that uh, that's a big leading indicator for a big spike in insolvencies, which I know you are seeing. Ah, right now. big spike in insolvencies. So so you think I'm going to be fine then? You're going to be Man, you are in just the perfect business. Well, um, let me ask you. Okay, so I'm going to flip this around on you. I want to ask you something. So you and I both look at the insolvency data pretty mm-hmm. closely. And so what I see in the last month data is you had a 17% increase in consumer insolvencies. But if you look at the dollar volume of liabilities in those filings, it was actually up 23%, mm-hmm. which just means that the average debt size is getting bigger mm-hmm. in these files, right? So 23% year over year is, is a serious jump, but also interesting to me is that business insolvencies jumped 30%. Now, rates went up a little bit, call it a year ago. So, you know, I'm trying to wrestle through well, what's driving this because because the headline employment numbers look good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not in a recession. Rates were up a year ago. So maybe there's just like the lagged effect of higher rates, but but I don't, that doesn't totally feel like that's the full explanation. So like, I got to ask you what, what is driving this? Because I'm somewhat stumped on it. Well, I never pay attention to business insolvencies because I think it's a meaningless number. And the reason is the vast majority of businesses that go out of business don't be don't become formally insolvent. They don't show up in the stats. So, you know, Mary's running a hair salon and she can't make a go of it anymore. So she shuts the door and you know, yeah, I get that. Off they go. So I think that's a that, that's a big driver of it. That you know, the, okay, when Sears went out of business, I guess that showed up as an insolvency. Mm-hmm. But the vast majority just sort of sort of Small fade away. Small businesses you're talking. Yeah, small businesses. But if you but have a liability as a business, you can't just fold it up. True. Or does it just follow you as, as a director? True. Um, no, the director's liabilities would only be things that a director is liable for, such as they co-signed the loan. Well, that wouldn't be the case in a massive corporation. Or things like government source deductions. So right. um, uh, taxes withheld from employees, that's a deemed trust. That's a director's obligation. GST, HST that hasn't been paid, that's a director's obligation. That follows you. Corporate income taxes that haven't been paid isn't a deemed trust. It doesn't follow a director. So a big corporation, though, that gets into trouble gets absorbed by another corporation. So Hmm. if, um, I don't know, Tesla eventually gets into trouble and goes out of business, they're not going to go bankrupt. They will be absorbed by Ford or Porsche or GM or somebody else. Maybe not GM. Or parts of it. They, parts or of it parts of it. Yeah, they'll, the you know, but somebody will take it. think, so when I look at business insolvencies, they sort of peaked in, call it 2011. And then it was a strong downward trend for eight years. Mm-hmm. And then we bounced hard off the bottom. And now we're, well, it's kind so of a I guess, bounce. I guess the other, the other factor would be you can't look at it on a macro level, you got to look at it on an individual level. So what kind of businesses are are getting into trouble? Well, I don't know, retail. There's mm-hmm. been a bunch of issues with that because now we just buy everything on Amazon so I don't need to go to a retail store anymore. Yeah, I, I do look at the, because they do break it down by industry. And I mean, retail is up, but I would say most of them are up. Like I just, I, I don't know. I, it, it feels to me like there's a signal there for, for the broader hmm. economy that, that that's bounced as hard as it has. Yeah, and, and obviously here we deal with the individuals, not the, the corporations. Mm-hmm. And so now we deal with lots of people who operated a business and ended up having to go personally uh, bankrupt or worked for a big business. I had a lady in here yesterday who worked at Sears. Right. And she had a pretty good job at Sears. And over the last year, it's taken her a bit of time to find another job, not quite as, as high paying as, uh, as what she originally had. So 
Uh, I mean, it's an interesting question you ask on on businesses, and I guess my overall response is, well, the sample size is fairly small. Like that is if, true. Like yeah. if in a in a year, one hundred and thirty thousand consumers are filing an insolvency, businesses are a few thousand. That's right. Yep, you're right. And so any little little swing can can make a difference. Um, uh, you know, perhaps there's also some foreign competition that factors into that. Now it's easier to, you know, ship stuff offshore. Although I guess that's really been the case for years. Maybe that's mm-hmm. not a, not a new thing, but. So you'd um, put less weight on that as a signal. I for the do. Economy. Like yeah. I, I, if I had to pick one thing, I would agree with you on the debt service ratio. It's, can I afford to pay it? Right. Doesn't matter how big your debt is. If your if job if your paycheck's going up by even more, then it doesn't matter. It's so is, not a is, big deal. Is that deal. the number one thing that's driving this rise in insolvencies? People just get maxed out; they hit a wall. Yeah, and and part of it is the mix of debt now too. So you're right that total debt has increased a little bit, but I'd have to look at the stats. I don't think it's as high as it was in 2011, for example. So I think it's it was the average debt level was going up for each insolvency. Then for a few years, it was going down. Okay, there's been a little bit of an uptick. Uh, recently. But what we're seeing is, you know, it used to be someone would come in here and yeah, I owe, you know, 50 grand to the bank. The interest rate is is 10%. I can't pay it. Now they come in here and well, I've got 5,000 on payday loans. Okay, well, that's a tiny number, 5,000, but the interest rate is 390%. Right. So your servicing costs are $15,000 a year. Well, you don't need much payday loan debt right. to get into trouble. That's, that's a good point. We've got the secondary lenders, and I'm not going to mention the names because I don't like getting sued as opposed to you. But there are a few of them um, um, that, uh, you know, the interest rate is almost 60%. So the payday loan companies now, Ontario changed the rules, made it a little hard, you know, lessened what they're allowed to charge. So now they're doing term loans. So instead of getting a $500 loan and paying, you know, $15 on $100, now they'll give you a $10,000 term loan. They can't charge you payday loan rates. They can only charge you up to 60%, but that's what mm. they're doing. So mm. the banks are, are cutting back a little bit, not as easy to lend, but I can go to that payday loan place or the, the second tier lender and get a, a loan. Now I'm paying 59%. Mm-hmm. So again, less debt, but way more carrying costs. So that's why we're seeing people get into trouble at lower levels of debt. They've got mm-hmm. no choice or they perceive that they have no choice. And that's that's what's causing the problem. So that's interesting to me because the message there is that you've got rising insolvencies with employment basically at the highs. And right. if I'm right that we get into a bit of soft patch in, in employment, I mean, you guys, what? you're not going to see your family for years maybe yeah. be stuck here at the office they can watch my videos <laughs> the when you talk about employment again you got to dig a little deeper because you what does employment mean so how do you become employed in the statistics well i work four hours a day i guess i'm employed mm-hmm. okay. yeah but you can dig in it's there's ways to look at it you can look at the what we call actual hours worked in the economy so that mm-hmm. that captures the total amount of hours worked by all employees. and what's interesting there so so that that smooths out it's a better indicator than the headline numbers, because you're right. You, you'd say, okay, well, Canada added 80,000 jobs last month, but really it was 100,000 part-time and we lost 20,000 full-time, yeah. right? And so you see weird things like that sometimes. But if instead you look at the hours worked, it sort of smooths that out. And and to your point, they're flattening out. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would say it looks, I mean, already in Canada, per capita real GDP is negative. So, so when you remove the effect of population growth, the actual amount of, of wealth being generated or output generated by each person is declining once you count for inflation. So that that's already sort of a recessionary indicator right there. Yeah, and here in in Toronto, I meet with tons of people who have more than one job. Very very sure. common. You know, they they're driving for Uber, mm-hmm. they're doing Uber Eats, you know, delivering meals and things like that. They've got a job, but you know, they're not getting all the hours they want or you know, I used to be making more. Now I've been downsized. Yeah. I'm making less. The so economy, yeah. the gig economy is yeah. huge. It, it's a real thing. It's for huge. Sure. We, I met with a bunch of people yesterday. Three of them had significant tax debt. Well, why is this? Well, because I had to be a self-employed contractor in order to work at this particular company. And one of them was, you know, I mean, I understand if you're a hairdresser, why they'd want you to be a self-employed contractor or a truck driver or something. Mm-hmm. That's pretty common. But one of them worked in, in a manufacturing company assembling mm. massive machinery. And I'm going, this makes no sense. Well, no, they, they made me set myself up as a self-employed contractor because, of course, they didn't want to have to pay CPP and EI and WSIB and all the rest yeah, of it. I don't think they can do that. They can't, but they did. 
And of course, two years later, she wasn't aware of all the implications with taxes and everything and not. Now she's got this big tax debt. And, and I don't believe she's at that company anymore because they probably got nailed by Revenue Canada mm-hmm. for doing that. But that's the kind of thing we're, we're seeing. So it's, you know, she's kind of quasi employed, but, you know, mm-hmm. I got to piece together a few different gigs and, you know, I do some dog walking on the side and I do this and I do that. And so yeah. the, it, it may show that you're employed. But if you've got to work two jobs, you know, I do Tim Hortons in the morning and I do something else in the afternoon and I'm, that's... It's marginal employment. I get that. I totally get that. Yeah, that's yeah. a, that's a yeah. tough thing. But, so. but, but nonetheless, if you get into an actual economic downturn where, where there are real job losses, regardless yeah. of where they're shed in the economy, I think that's, I mean, with, with insolvencies already where they are and with consumers as stretched as they are, that, that's a really, really concerning potential development. Yeah. And I think there's probably a lot more jobs in the service economy than there are in the manufacturing economy, for example. That is for sure. I mean, again, I'm going to make this up, but I would guess that if you take a look at how many people work in the auto industry in Ontario today versus 20 years ago, it's got to be less, way down. And so those were really high paying jobs with benefits, with pensions. And now those people are working in service economy jobs, making a lot less. So they're still employed. We're still at 100% employment close Mm -hmm. but mm, you know uh, that individual person is is making a lot less so the economy as a whole may be doing well it's kind of like looking at the average temperature you know so it's it's minus 10 in the arctic and and you know plus 100 in uh, toronto oh so the temperature in in canada is 50 well that's a meaningless stat right it's absolutely meaningless so i I mean I, i guess to summarize i agree with you that there are some warning signs out there um, I cannot predict the future either. I don't have a clue. I mean, we, Ted and I did our year-end podcast in December and we predicted, well, Ted predicted that the insolvency rate would go up 10% this year. And I laughed at him and I said, Ted, it's been going down for seven straight years. It was like flat in 2018. Maybe it'll be 5% up. Well, like you said, you know, over the last month or two, it's been at an annual rate of, you know, 13, 14, 15%, mm-hmm. depending on what metric you look at. So what's it going to be for the end of the year? I don't know. It'll be up. It'll it obviously will be up by by more than we thought. So if me, who is you know meeting with people every day, can't gauge what's going to happen, um, I think. But when the when the swing happens, it can happen fairly quickly, yeah. Because the the snowball effect happens. So I mean, I'm certainly advising people now's the time to be deleveraging and getting out of debt, not taking out taking Without out more. Question. And so let's close the show by what, with whatever advice you would be giving, not to the institutional investors that you advise, but to the average guy. You've already mm-hmm. said that real estate, yeah, it's probably not going to crash in the next little while. Would you be, um, you know, buying an investment property now, or would you oh, I'm not? not to I'm not going to go there. I mean, that's that's a, such a personal decision. So I'm not going to okay. give that sort of advice. What I would say is, look, if you're concerned about your debt levels now. Um, it's probably always advisable to come in and talk to an insolvency trustee like you guys before it becomes completely unbearable and you're drowning, right? I mean, getting ahead of the problem is a big, is, is, is a big part of the, the solution. Uh, and um, this is the sort of thing you want to think about now before you absolutely have to do that, right? And so... Yeah, come in, get 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 a. I mean, this is not this was not a planned pitch. That was a planned <laughs> pitch. So this would be the the commercial. So but I, I listen. I, I I totally believe in the services that you guys provide, and and it's necessary more so now than ever. And I think um, people that are sort of on the fence at this point with with potentially a bit of softness in the economy, like this, now is the time to start dealing with those excesses and um, set yourself on a on a better path going forward well and as a general rule debt problems don't get better over time no that's right unfortunately well i mean they can it, with with some guidance and with some you know with a, with a good solid plan yeah with, without a plan compounding interest works both ways right that's and exactly it can right. certainly go in the in the wrong direction yeah excellent ben thanks very much for being here my pleasure it's great to have you on that is our show for today uh i'm doug hoys thanks for listening that was debt free in 30 